<laughs> All right, well, let's get started. Good morning to each of you. Uh, we're going to approach things a little bit differently today because uh, instead of uh, reading, just uh, starting with the reading of the text, I want to give you things to watch for, and then I think this passage will be very simple. Today what I want to do is um, I want to talk to you about the prostitute. <laughs> okay? And uh, remember that there are really three ways that the city of Rome is pictured in the book of Revelation. The first way is that it's, Rome is pictured as the sea beast. The second thing is the earth beast. <coughs> and the third way is the prostitute. Now we've spent, we, we've mentioned what the prostitute is. And we've spent a lot of time with the sea beast and earth beast. But let's remind ourselves what the sea beast was. Remember this came? John stood, the, the, the devil stood at the sea, at the shore of the sea. And we said the sea is the sea of humanity. And out of the sea of humanity comes the government. So the sea beast represents the governmental power of Rome. The government power. Remember that the earth beast really is subservient to the sea beast, but remember it represents emperor worship. But the thing that really powers Rome is the economic power of Rome. So you could picture Rome and talk about its wealth. The uh, remember that in the picture that we're given, this power is really a false power. Because the power is really with God and not with the government. Remember that this kind of worship is really a false religion. And remember that this kind of economic power is a false wealth. I would argue that although this is very much talking about our time in 70 AD. This is very true for us today. We are deceived by the, the devil in three areas. We're deceived by false power, by false religion, and by false wealth. Those three things is really going to pertain to us, but that's what's really being talked about here. Now, I need to talk about why we would call false wealth the prostitute. Why would we do that? What, what woman is really being talked about in the, the, the beautiful woman? Who's the beautiful woman that actually we haven't met yet, but she's going to appear? Not the beautiful woman. Well, uh, you're right, Babylon is the beautiful woman, but as the prostitute. Who's the opposite of the prostitute? The bride of Christ, the pure bride of Christ. So the comparison is being made here between the pure bride of Christ and the prostitute. So between real wealth and false wealth. Mm -hmm. The same thing when you look actually at the problems. The first couple of chapters of the problem, you see the the Yeah, in fact, and and Proverbs is not the only place in the Old Testament where we see that comparison, is it? In fact, over and over, the, um, the prostitute is used to talk about how Israel behaved when they 
went after false gods, especially false wealth. So this picture would be well known to, the, to these people. I think it's also interesting that John, who's very aware that the number for God is three, and that you view the three aspects of God, notice he's got the three aspects of Rome. So this is a, a really well put together. It's like it's inspired. Okay. <laughs> now, I'm going to take this away because I want to show you, uh, I'm going to, before we read the text again, I want to show you a few things. You need to understand who the prostitute is. To do that, I'm going to just show you several verses that we're going to read. So here's the things to watch for. In Revelation 17.9, it's talking about the prostitute, and it says, She sits on seven hills. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. We pointed out that seven hills was well known as the city of Rome at that time. The next thing we have is, it says she rules the earth in John's day. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. You're reading this in 70 AD, you're in the Middle East, there is only one city that meets that description. That's in 1718, so watch for that when we come to it. She persecutes the saints. In 17.6, I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. In 18.20, rejoice over her, O heaven, rejoice. Saints and apostles and prophets, God has judged her for the way she treated you. 18.24, in her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints, and of all who have been killed on the earth. You see that? She's the leading commercial power in John's world. In 18.3, the merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive lux luxuries. 18.11, the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn because no one buys their cargoes anymore. 18.15, the merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her. And 1819, woe, woe, O great city, where all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. You see, I'm just kind of putting these together for you so you can see. I, I, when we read this, I want you to understand who this is. And the fact that she is going to be destroyed from within, 1716. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. So the sea beast, who's supposed to be her colleague, is the one that actually destroys her. Got it? So when you're reading about this, here's what I want you convinced of. All of these things are true. So the conclusion is... The prostitute is Rome, viewed through, through her economic power. That's what I want you to see. The sea beast is the government power of Rome, so we're viewing Rome in different ways. We're viewing Rome through the government power, the sea beast, through the false religion, emperor worship, and through her economic power, her wealth, her luxuries. Got it? You ready to look at the text now? Because the text is exciting, but I wanted you to have this so you know who she is. I kind of gave you the answer before we read the text. Now we're ready. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls, remember last week we saw the bowls that were poured out? came to me and said, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitutes, prostitute who sits on many waters. 
Uh, why, would, why would the wealthy be described as those who sit on many waters? It's the sea of humanity. So the wealth comes from the people. With her the kings of the earth committed adultery, and inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. What does this mean, the kings of the earth committed adultery? Why would he say that's adultery? Who should they be, who should the kings of the earth recognize as wealthy? They should recognize God as the one who is wealthy. But when we're deceived, who do we think is really in power? We think, well, when we're deceived, we don't even know it's Satan, right? When we're deceived, we actually think that all this wealth that the world presents is what we should be striving for. And so when we look at that, that's even the kings of the earth who are interested in, in having a lot of stuff. They don't recognize the true God. Instead, they go for the wealth. So they've committed adultery. The inhabitants of the earth are intoxicated by the wine of her adulteries. Does that make sense? People like us, we're intoxicated by wealth. The angel carried me away into the, in the spirit into a desert. This reminds me uh, of what, what has happened with Jesus. It reminds me of what happens with um, what is he, um, Elijah. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names. Now, the picture here is the woman is sitting on the sea beast. Do you see that that makes sense? The wealth of Rome is possible because of what? Because of the government of Rome. So you picture her as riding this sea beast. And that sea beast has seven heads and ten horns. We already talked about this, but who are the seven heads? Right over here I listed the Roman emperors. Augustus, Tiberius, Caligula, Claudius, Nero, Vespasian, and Titus. Those are the seven we're talking about. Got it? Okay. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet, I think this is to emphasize her prostitute, glittering with gold, precious stones, and pearls. You see, she's wealthy. It's the wealth. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. This was written on her forehead. Mystery, Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. Wow. Why does he call her Babylon? It was one of the great cities that was also consumed by its own wealth, right? They think they're in charge. They think their money can buy everything. I saw the woman was drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. Why would we say that? Well, we'd say that because the saints, in order to participate in this economy, if they wanted to be a merchant, they had to join the trade guild, and the trade guild required them to worship the emperor. So when you became a Christian in 70 AD, you lost your job. You didn't get to participate in the wealth. Were the Christians generally known in the early centuries as being wealthy? They were not the wealthy people. And they were not wealthy because a lot of them who had wealth lost their wealth when they became Christians because they couldn't get a job anymore. So it's fair to say that she was drunk with their blood. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Why would John be astonished? Aren't all of us astonished? Really? If you, if, if you really face it in yourself? If you really say, how do I live my life? And then, 
if I really saw God and saw that I'm looking at God now and God is punishing that, can you say, yeah, I do fall for this. I fall for this in my life. You know, beauty will do that to anyone. Uh, this, this prostitute to, to the eye would be beautiful. Until you, but it has nothing to do with what's running through her. Right. Her blood is not beautiful. <laughs> the blood of the of the, uh, of the saints is yeah. where the, the real beauty is, but we don't see that. Exactly. You know, we look beyond. We don't look beyond the physical. Well, I'm just thinking that this really is love. You know, for most of us, at least we love love is it's comfort, you know, security. Yeah. And just this entire image that really we have, you know, this. This prostitute right, and this dangerous beast, which is like the exact opposite of comfort and security. So I would say, you know, I'm astonished at that moment. Like, this thing that I understand to be very safe and secure really isn't. Okay, so yeah, so um, for those of you that, that couldn't necessarily hear, and for the microphone too, uh, what Eric is telling us is is very true. John is astonished because this looks like something that is um, beautiful, but it's all false. It, 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 looks, it looks like the woman riding the beast is kind of scary, but we're looking for comfort. And there isn't comfort. <laughs> so it's an incongruous kind of match that he's seeing here. That's why he's astonished. Then the angel said to me, <laughs> I always love it when you can talk to an angel right there. <laughs> why are you astonished? <laughs> well, John could have given a whole lecture here, right? But the, the angel didn't wait for him to respond. The angel said, I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and the beast she rides, which has seven, horn, seven heads and ten horns. Okay, that's what I need. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Here we go. The beast which you saw once was, Nero, now is not Vespasian, and will come out of the abyss to go to his destruction. In other words, what you need to know is he's going to be destroyed. He's going to come out of the abyss in Domitian, but he's going to be destroyed. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because she once was Nero, now is not Vespasian, and will come. Domitian. This calls for a mind with wisdom. That's what we're trying to do. <laughs> the seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. They are also seven kings. Seven kings. Got it? Five have fallen. These five. One is at six. Another has not yet come, but when he does come, he must remain for a little while. That's Titus. The beast who once was and now is not is the eighth king. The beast who once was and now is not is the eighth king. You got it? The beast who once was and now is not is the eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. Why are we so concerned about the beast of Nero as Christians? What did Nero do? He was vicious against the Christians in the city of Rome. There's no evidence that Nero persecuted Christians outside of the city. But in the city of Rome, he tried to wipe them out. So that's the horrible one. There was no effort among Vespasian and Titus to get rid 
of uh, to persecute Christians. But when Domitian came back, he demanded that people refer to him as God. That presented a problem for Christians because they couldn't worship him as God. The others recommended you worship them as God. They said they were God, but Domitian demanded that you worship him as God. Remember, these three kings who are mentioned in Daniel when we were counting there were the period of rebellion. And so when Daniel is counting, he's not as obsessed with the number seven. Daniel refers to the ten and then puts Domitian as number eleven. So in Daniel's counting, we have a little different count. But we have the same thing going on. It is Domitian he talks about. The ten horns, I'm wondering about these, so I'm glad he's going to explain this. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received a kingdom, but for, who for one hour will receive authority as kings as long, along with the beast. Here's who I think these are. The fact that it's one hour tells you what? It's a short time. And they rule along with the other one, right? These ten horns. What did Rome do? Well, like in Palestine, what did they do? Who did they allow to rule? They had puppet kings. They had client kings, didn't they? Set up throughout the kingdom, they would have local guys. Now, they kind of made a mistake with Herod. Okay, uh, they, not that Herod wasn't a great guy. I mean, Herod was a great guy. Um, but uh, they made a little mistake with him because they thought they were picking a Jew, but Herod really wasn't Jewish. Herod was an Edomite. And the Edomites and the Jews didn't get along. Of course, nobody got along with the Jews. So they were kind of cousins, but you see that the Jews were upset with Herod, but the Romans didn't even know that because, frankly, the Italians try to get it right, but we're lovers, not... <laughs> <you know. laughs> we're not in really into all this government stuff, and so we missed it a little bit. We thought Herod was Jewish. We appointed him the king of the Jews and thought they'd be happy. And brother, that didn't work out. So, I think these are the client kings. They have power. They don't really have a kingdom, but they're called kings. You see that? So, and they get their authority along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. Got it? They will make war against the lamb. And I love this. This is the verse. If you want to know what the book of Revelation is saying, this is the theme of the book. Look at it. I already underlined it. Didn't even know it. They will make war against the Lamb, but the Lamb will overcome them because he is Lord of Lord and King of Kings, and with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Don't you love that? Yeah. <laughs> all these kings with all this power make war against what? A Lamb. <laughs> I love the picture! Yeah. You know, I wish it would have said something like, these kings, will, with all their power, will make war against the one who was all-powerful. No, it doesn't say that. They make war against the lamb. I'm glad he uses the lamb there. He uses the lamb because it's sacrifice. And it's the lamb that was sacrificed that gives us power. And we can never forget that. In our life, in my life, I forget often that it's the Lamb who gives me the power, not the other things. And notice this, we win. Why do we win? Because He is the Lord, and He is the King. And what am I? I get to tail along. I don't do any fighting, do I? I just show up. Wow. However, sometimes that's the hardest part. <laughs> <laughs> the hardest part is showing up. The hardest part is showing up sometimes. It's also hard when you think you have to fight the battle. 
battle that's already been fought and won. And that's the whole point. The battle's been fought and won, and yet we think we have to fight the battle. The way this is pictured in the book of Revelation is it's fought, it's won, it's over. They're here for a short time. Deal with it. You win. I love that. The angel said to me, the waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. Isn't that what we said? The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. Now let's make sense of this. <laughs> look, at, look at what goes on. Maybe we can relate it to today. Because really when you look at it, governments over time really don't like wealth, do they? They get their power from the wealth, but what, it, what governments want power. And when, when you get, people get too wealthy, they begin to get power. So what do you do? You tax them. You take away their money so that you can have the power. So it's like... It's like I get my power from the wealth, but I'm going to take away their wealth because i got to have power. All governments take away the power from the wealthy. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. What happens? All governments have done this. <laughs> you finally get, take so much wealth from the wealthy so you can have power that your government falls because there are no more wealthy to give you money. It's not a new thing. <laughs> it's gone on a long time. God has put it in their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to give the beast their power to rule until God's words are fulfilled. What does that verse tell you? It's a pretty important verse. God put it in whose hearts? Well, the wealthies, the prostitute. Who is serving God's purpose here? The prostitute. Who's in charge? God is clearly in charge. Do you see this? Although the devil thinks he's in charge, and although it looks like they're, he's motivating them, ultimately God is in charge. Amen. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. That's what we said, right? I'm glad they explained that to me. Now I'm ready for 18. 18.1. After this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority. And the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice, he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons, a haunt for e every evil spirit, a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. For the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries, the kings of the earth committed adultery with her. The merchants of the earth grew rich from her excessive luxuries. Who is Babylon in this case? It's the city of Rome. Did this happen with Babylon? Not literally, but yes. What you need to realize is, is that this same prophecy is used about Babylon. Do you want to go there? We ought to go there. We're, I'm going to take you there. I got to get out of some of this other stuff, but I'm going to take you to that. To which? Oh, um, um, yeah. There is a significance to the vultures, to the bird. Yes, and and uh, uh, the significance of that is when when you see vultures is when they're already dead, right? And so you have the, we don't have to wait. God has already done this. And you don't have to wait until you see the nation destroyed to know it's going to be destroyed. So the vultures show up because they're already dead. So it's just, they're just circling. Uh, sometimes they say eagles, sometimes they say vultures. 
All right, now, um, here's the destruction of Babylon in Isaiah 13, 17. Behold, I am stirring up the Medes against them. This is the Medes, the Medo-Persian Empire, against the city of Babylon, who have no regard for silver and do not delight in gold. Their bows will slaughter the young men. They will have no mercy on the fruit of the womb. Their eyes will not pity children. And Babylon, the glory of kingdoms, the splendor and pomp of the Chaldeans, will be like Sodom and Gomorrah when God overthrew them. It will never be inhabited or lived in for all generations. No Arab will pitch his tent there. No shepherds will make their flocks lie down there. It's not a literal statement. 200 years after Babylon fell, what did Alexander the Great do? He shows up in Babylon. He makes that his camp. It's still a thriving city 200 years later. The picture is not that he's literally doing this. The picture is that when I destroy Babylon, I have destroyed it as a power in the world. It will not be a world power again. That's the same picture we have about Rome. Some of you have been to Rome. I haven't. I didn't want to go to southern Italy because the southern Italians are lazy. A little too much effort to go. It was too much effort for me to go there, and I'm a southern Italian. My father, my father went to, Italy, to southern Italy. My heritage is Italian. My father went to southern Italy, and he goes, don't bother to go there. He said, they're lazy bums. I said, Dad, where did our family come from? He goes, oh, just, just west of Rome. <laughs> just, yeah, just east of Rome. Yeah. <laughs> it was great. I love it. So, uh, you know, you, you got you to gotta appreciate this whole thing. And so is, is this... Is this really the message is that this thing happens over and over again through time? Yes. Cities and powers come and go, but the, the battle has been won. So the battle today is for the people who are caught up in the things about false powers and false gods and those kind of things. Because they will be caught up in the eternal destruction if the Christians uh, who are the believers are not trying to touch those lives to to see that, that's exactly what this book is saying. This book is saying this has happened over and over throughout time. God is in charge of this world and he even uses wicked nations to accomplish his purpose. But through all of that, when a nation becomes too wicked, he destroys it. He destroys their economic power, he destroys their governmental power. And he says, what I need in the world is I need some people who are faithful to me. And I'd like you to be my faithful witness. I'd like you to stand and tell people that I am God. And these other things are not God. And we do that in a variety of ways by the way we live our lives. We will have power and we will have wealth, but we have to recognize that those things are not what drives us? Um, I can't help but think um, the, the Christians that came out of Nazi Germany, Dietrich Bonhoeffer, Tory Timber, people who stood and spoke the truth when that was going on, and, and they were sacrificed for it. But at the same time, you think to yourself, what kind of courage does it take in a situation like that? to stand and say, the power is not what you see as the power. And we have seen courageous people like that stand in a variety of nations, um, and they have changed many lives because of their witness. And uh, they are examples to all of us. Um, uh, you know, you, you can't really read this without taking a peek at Ezekiel. I know that I like Ezekiel really well. It's one of my favorite books. I like it because, uh, like in Ezekiel 27, verse 2 here, he says, Now you, son of man, that's the way God always refers to Ezekiel. 
he refers to him as son of man. I think God should remind us of that. When God talks to you, he says, you, son of man. <laughs> Why? Because sometimes we think we're a son of God. <laughs> yeah, we think that we're God. We think we make the rules. We don't make any rules. You, son of man, I'm going to talk to you. Okay, here we go. Raise a lamentation over Tyre. Tyre is a city on, was a city, on the coast of the Mediterranean. And it was really on an island separated by a causeway. And when the, the uh, tide was low, you could actually walk across the causeway and get to Tyre. But when it was high, you couldn't. So it was very well protected and easy to defend. When Alexander the Great came there to destroy the city of Tyre, what he did is he spent two years b bringing in loads and loads of gravel and he filled in the causeway so that his army could march right across and attack the city. So since that time, once he built the causeway, then it all silted in and filled in. So it's no longer separated as an island when you go to Tyre today. But in those days, Tyre was a powerful city, a great wealthy trading city. And so it's got a great history. Merchant of the peoples to many coastlands, O Tyre, you have said, I am perfect in beauty. Your borders are in the heart of the seas. See, they're an island. Your builders made perfect your beauty. They made all your planks of fir trees from center. They took a cedar from Lebanon to make a mast for you. It goes on. It talks about how wealthy the city is. I kind of like this because in Ezekiel 27 it says, The inhabitants of Sidon and Arvad, that's pretty close to Arvada where I live. <laughs> they were your rowers. I mean, they talk about how great Tyre was in its day. Yeah, I, I need a plug for Arvada there, to, you know, so it's okay. He goes on and on about how Tyre, Tarshish did business with you because of your great wealth of every kind. Silver, iron, tin, lead, they exchange for your wares. Um, they're talking about the, the, the vessels of bronze for your merchandise. They're talking about war horses. They're talking about everything that you can imagine that you're going to be dealing with here. And... Judah traded with you meal, honey, oil, balm, Damascus. Look at all the people doing business with them. This is a great city. And they began to think that they were, that their power, um, they, they began to think they were too powerful. And so God destroyed them. I guess we ought to go back to our text. I could spend a long time reading all of Ezekiel's 27 to you. You should probably do that sometime. Um, you can get down to 34. Now you are wrecked by the seas, by the depths of the waters. See, he's saying, yeah, you're, you're ruined now. Okay, we'll go back. I'll be lamenting about Tyre and not get finished with this. I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so you will not share in her sins. You see what he's calling us to do? We may not be able to physically leave the city, but come out of her. Like the people in Nazi times who live in their houses, they're not in that. Even though they're living in the city, even though they're being attacked by them, their mind is not there. That is the power of a witness. Her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she's done. Mix her a double portion from her own cup. Give her as much torture and grief as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I sit as a queen. Boy, that sounds like what we read in Ezekiel, doesn't it? I am not a widow, I will never mourn, therefore in one day her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, famine, she'll be consumed by fire, for mighty is the Lord who judges her. That's not a literal fire, it's just saying she is destroyed. When the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Now why are the 
kings weeping and mourning when they see that the city of Rome is no longer an economic power. Because that is the source of their wealth. They're not sad to see Rome go down. They're sad because <laughs> they're losing too. <laughs> Terrified at her torment, they'll stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour your doom has come. One hour just means quickly. The merchants of the earth. So here the kings were, the merchants of the earth now, will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Why are the merchants upset? We're not making any money. Uh, cargoes of gold, silver, precious stones, pearls, fine linen, purple, silk, and scarlet cloth. What's not listed there? A burlap? Yeah, well, why is burlap not mentioned there? Because what did the common people wear? They wore burlap. This is the luxuries. Do you see that? These are all luxury items. You don't have to have a purple robe, and you don't have to have silk cloth, although I do like it. I, uh, <laughs> every kind of citron wood, not just normal wood, articles made of every kind of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, marble, cargoes of cinnamon, spice, incense, myrrh, frankincense, wine, olive oil, fine flour, wheat, cattle, sheep, horses, and carriages. And then I love this. And bodies and souls of men. Wow. What does that mean? It means they're slaves. Because there was a big time slave trade and they're talking about You've been buying their bodies and souls, and I'm putting an end to it. You know, it's, it's almost like you know, the, the wealth was made off of the backs of the poor. Well, and they, they slaves. Yep. It was. And they will say, The fruit you long for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished, never to be recovered. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off terrified at her torment, they will weep and mourn and cry out, Oh, woe, woe, great city, dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet, and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. So the merchants are upset because <laughs> they can't trade their wealthy cargoes anymore. The sea captains, of course, are upset because they can't take their sea cargoes there anymore. Do you see it's talking about the destruction of the power of Rome to do this. Verse 20, rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you. He's saying, she treated you like you were not an important person to me. Like you did not recognize where real power was. And he's saying, you should rejoice because God has made himself known. And we should always rejoice when we see that God is being viewed by more people as God. A mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone and threw it into the sea and said with such violence the great city of Babylon will be thrown down never to be found again. Why does he emphasize such a large stone? It's the way that my um, ancestors here in America did business. They put cement shoes on people. Then they throw them into the, uh, into the water, right? Why'd they put the cement shoes on them? They don't come back. They aren't floating up to the top, right? We're going to give you a pair of cement shoes. That's the idea here. I don't want this thing floating back up. I'm tired, in this case, of the city of Rome. Now, he's using the term Babylon because the people relate to what happened to Babylon, but they got to see Babylon happen, Rome happen, Nazi Germany happen. All those things are where God is showing his power. Then notice the list here, 
All these things are luxuries. There is no joy left in the city. A millstone. The reason a millstone is mentioned there is because the poor people didn't get mill, uh, milled wheat. They didn't get it ground down. That cost money to do that. You had to eat it without being ground down. Uh, the lamp. Poor people didn't have lamps. They couldn't afford the oil. The bride and bridegroom. There is no joy left in the city. It's like we don't even want to get married anymore because there is no wealth here. Your merchants were the world's great men. By your magic spell, all the nations were led astray. Your magic spell? Who's this talking about? The prostitute. See, that's why she's called the prostitute. Because it's by her magic spell that they're led astray. Who should they have been worshiping? They should have been with God. They weren't. In her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and all who have been killed on the earth. We got it? The message I want to leave you with today is we need to be a faithful witness and stand before people and say, we follow God. There is a higher power. Yes, all these things look like power, but we are not followers of that. Next week we'll be in chapters 19 and 20. We have some fun there. Yes? <laughs> wow, that's a great point. An earthly lament, but it's a heavenly celebration. That's right. It's a heavenly celebration because God is showing his power. And we're always excited when God shows his power. We aren't excited to see people killed. We're excited to see God show his power. All right, we'll see you next week.